Hello, it's Larry Clark with another Meet the Composer episode today, and we have Connor Warren-Smith here, composer, with Dr. Judd Bonner. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. So, Judd, take it away and ask the questions that your students and yourself are dying to ask. All right. Well, Connor, it's good to see you again. It's good to uh, see you, too. I know you're, you've been busy up until about a couple weeks ago, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you start off by telling us about your background, uh, where you were educated and your interest in music and then your interest in composing. Sure, sure. And just stop me along the way if there's anything you want to right. touch on more. Um, right. I, I grew up uh, doing church music. Uh, it was always very a big part of my, my life. Um, in middle school, joined the band for one year and then the choir because we had we had to choose we couldn't do both um uh so i did band for a little while and then i was like oh, i really i really want to sing so i quit and joined choir um which was like very upsetting to all of my band friends <laughs> um, but i ended up really falling in love with singing um and have was in choir ever since then all through high school um did musical theater um, and just really like found a, a, a passion for music and performing and singing. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to study that in college. Um, I went to California Baptist University in Riverside um, and I got a bachelor's degree in music composition and a master's degree in conducting. My conducting teacher professor was actually Dr. Judd Bonner. Uh, so <laughs> that's how we know each other. Um, and, uh, uh, I had a great, really great experience at CBU. Um, what I really loved about our program was just the huge emphasis that we had on performances, um, and constantly being out there, um, and, you know, doing it. So getting to, to travel all over and, and sing for different audiences all over the place um, was great. Yeah. And you um, were one of the, oh, go ahead. No, no. What, what was your question? Well, you were one of the most hardworking students we ever had there, but your, your career, at least after you graduated, sort of deviated from conducting mm -hmm. and educating into performing yeah. as a professional singer for Disney. Yeah. Uh, in addition to getting some music uh, composed and published, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us a yeah. little bit about that deviation, how that occurred. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was in um, my, my undergrad in college, I knew that I like wanted to be a performer, um, but it was one of those things where I, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to do it. So the like smart thing was, let's just get a master's degree and I can have this backup plan of, you know, if I don't make it, I can go into a different avenue and, and have a, a safety net. Um, so I, I stayed for the master's degree. Um, and then af after I was done, just kind of hit, hit the ground running and auditioned for everything that I possibly could. Um, so I... The first, the first thing that I really landed was um, was a gig at, at Universal Studios Hollywood, um, doing uh, uh, their Grinchmas event that they do at Christmas time. So I was uh, one of the singing Who's uh, from Whoville, um, and that was fun. And that kind of like got me into the like the theme park community, um, per performing pool of people that that do those stuff. So now. Now I still do shows at Universal, and um, in the last year got cast as uh, um, Olaf in Frozen at the Hyperion over at, at California Adventure. Um, so that's my like nine to five essentially is being a performer um, for either Disneyland or Universal Studios. Um, that's my like consistent job job, um, mm -hmm. which is great that that is is my like go to work job and it's still performing it's still doing what i love um so i'm really happy about that yeah. um and then aside from that i do a lot of vocal work for tv and film 
um, different recording sessions for, for movies like um, the new Mulan, um, Call of the Wild, I sang on recently, um, done some different TV shows, Ellen and whatnot. Um, yeah. So that stuff is really fun too. And I, I, I find that, that uh, process of the music industry to be my like real passion of what I love doing. Um, but like other facets of the music industry, it is very up and down in terms of when you're making lots of money and then when you're not doing anything. So to ha- sure. supplement the, the um, Universal and Disney stuff with film work is, has been really beneficial to me. And then for, for writing and composing, um, Excelsia is one of the publishers that's published one of my pieces and another one is coming out in 2020. Um, for me, it was, that was kind of like a, a side passion. I, it was, it was like a, a, I don't know, tertiary or parallel thing going on, but it was never like, I'm going to be a composer. Um, so, uh, what's funny, uh, it, it was in college, I actually started out as a vocal performance major, um, because I wanted to sing. Um, and then in the program, seeing more and more how that was like very opera and classical focused. And I love those genres of music, but that's just not what my voice does well. Right. Um, so then it was either my branches were, all right, I can do music education or I can do theory and composition. I didn't really want to teach at that time. So I was like, all right, well, let's, let's give theory and composition a try. Um, and I ended up really, really enjoying it. Um, and then writing different pieces for, for the vocal groups at CBU, including, um, the university choir and orchestra that you conducted. Um, I think the first, was the Star Spangled Banner the first one I wrote? I I think think so. so, Yeah. Yeah. And, um, that one is now published. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's funny how those things happen, like, as you're going down one path, something just kind of comes in and, and if you're open to it and you say yes, you have no idea what doors are going to open for you in that. Well, let me ask you this. Now that you're probably put on hold as far as singing, um, performing with groups at least, Mm -hmm. um, are you feeling motivated to compose any music? Um, uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, the whole, this whole thing is just so stressful. Um, <laughs> but uh, at least for me, when it comes to writing, I'm, I'm not one of those writers that's like, let me take a walk outside and just have the inspiration fall on me and then let me bust out a song. Like, I'm a much more um, goal-oriented or like focused person so I I kind of need the um parameters to be funneled into you know right for example when you were having me write the Star Spangled Banner you were you were saying all right well I want it's I want we're doing a national anthem I want it to be impressive but I also want it to have you know nice unison lines maybe some prime unison moments branching out into the you know six part chords like, you know, you were giving me um, Parameters. clear direction and then leaving it open for where I wanted to take it after that. Um, and that I find my work to be much, a lot quicker for sure if people give me uh, parameters like that. But overall, the process is just a lot easier. So like recently, um, uh, uh, around Christmas time, I wrote, six arrangements for Legoland. They have an acapella group down there. Um, And so they said, you know, they had three songs that they specifically wanted with a clear idea of what they wanted. And then the other three, they were kind of like, well, we're thinking about this and we're thinking about this and, and you can kind of run with that. And for me, that was a really great balance of like, like, all right, I know exactly what I'm doing for their Jingle Bells and their Rudolph. And then they want a couple like, more out there mashups and I could 
you know, go with my own ideas for that. But I was already kind of like in the zone from doing the stuff that they had specifically laid out. I at least find that for me as a, as a writer, having the like clear, here's what we're doing tends to be a lot better for me than just all over the place. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, considering your experience, maybe we should go a little bit different direction with this. I mean, you kind of uh, made a successful uh, way into two professions, musical professions that are very difficult to be successful at. So yeah. with either one, why don't you give some of our students an idea of how you did it? How did you make it? I mean, I remember saying at your recital, whatever you uh, didn't have in talent, you made up for by working harder than anybody else. But what are some of the ways that you scrambled to make it in either one of those avenues? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think there are different avenues, but help each other out. So I, I think they are still tied together, at least as it pertains to your question. Um, I think just a, a willingness to put yourself out there and mm -hmm. a, a drive to work hard. Um, I think when, when I was a kid in middle school and high school, I think I had this idea that like, if I just put myself out there, like some random music producer was just gonna like discover me <laughs> and then, you know, everything was gonna happen. And that's- Everybody true. wants that, come on. Well, it's true. <laughs> and that just, it doesn't happen for like 99.9% .9 of people. That's not how it works. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. so, I, I had to, you know, put in the work and do uh, uh, like, you know, A, work on me and hone my craft and my skills, um, but B, you know, showing up to things, always having a good attitude and trying to, to like make a good impression, um, auditioning for everything that I could. Um, and you know the the cheesy line of like believing in yourself is for sure real but not being being willing to like take rejection and keep going so like having a sense of resiliency um when people are saying no um and knowing that you know maybe i wasn't right for this show or for this casting agency but these people will like me so you know, mm -hmm. how do you handle correction? If you submit something, either the way that you're performing something or composing something, how do you yeah. respond when somebody says, well, I don't really like this or can you change that? Um, oh, <laughs> it really varies. It varies a lot by how it's delivered too. Cause there's, I mean, there's pieces that I've submitted to different publishers and sometimes they're like, oh no, this is terrible. And those are the ones where I'm like, oh, you're a jerk. <laughs> um, but there's other times where, where they're like, oh, you know, this doesn't quite go in line with our catalog, but we like what you're doing. And those, I mean, those are like, okay, great. We'll just try a different, a different person or here's a different piece. Um, and, and then there are some, are some people who are, are really great at, either steering the ship in a different direction or like gently um, saying, no, this isn't right. Um, and you just, you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to deal with people saying that your, your stuff isn't good enough and knowing that that doesn't necessarily mean that you as a person are not good enough. Disassociating right. those two um, right. is important. But right. I think when, because uh, uh, Be Thou My Vision was my first song that got published. And I sent that out to, I think, maybe 30 or 35 different publishers, which you're like, this was something that I had to learn, but that's not what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you're, you're supposed to send it to one person at a time and give them a chance to say, no, we don't like this, or yes, we want it. And, you know, I was just figuring out the the 
music publishing industry at the time. Um, and so I had sent it out to like a bunch of people. And then I found out that they were talking to each other <laughs> about it. Like, do you know who this Connor Smith is? I just got this song. And then somebody, thankfully somebody did tell me like, hey Connor, just letting you know, this is not what you're supposed to do because <laughs> otherwise I would have kept doing that. Um, so yeah, one publisher at a time. Um, and luckily it was, it was Alfred that, um, that decided to to publish that one, and then they did the Star Spangled Banner, and then Excelsior has done um, the Sunrise Will Come, and uh, their 2020 song is called uh, "I Hear Love." Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So, do you have a preference in what you listen to? I mean, what we listen to to a certain extent informs what we write and what we work on. Sure. Have a preference in that? What you listen to? Um, I I like a lot of different music um i i listen i would say the majority of what i listen to is like top 40 pop stuff that's on the radio um with like, like some great vocal group stuff um whether that's like jazz vocal jazz or like um modern like contemporary acapella groups like pentatonics um are one of my favorites um and there's a whole you know subgenre of contemporary acapella groups that that are are out there pentatonics is just like the number one um and then like i also listen to a lot of broadway and show tunes and stuff um dear evan hansen was like i think i wore that cd out this past year um right it's one of my favorites yeah yeah good well, if you could make a living in either one of these realms, and, and it looks like right now it's it's going to be performance, but if, if you could choose, which one would you do it in? Um, ideal path. Well, I, I, I think the avenue where I found that both of these intersect really strongly is in studio work. Um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of times where, you know, we're singing something, um, that's, you know, for a, a TV show, for instance, and the composers in the, uh, the recording in the booth were in the studio and he's saying, you know, oh, something's wrong. Like, I don't know what to do. And there's usually one person in the recording studio who's like, essentially the captain of whatever recording session is going on. And they get to be the ones that say, let's try this. So oh, well, we can, we can tweak these chords here. And, you know, how about we try it just unison, like throwing out those different ideas. Um, and especially in recording sessions where things are a little more fluid um, and the producers might not know exactly what they want. There's a lot more opportunity for, um, adjustments going along the way in terms of like arrangement and whatnot. Um, and so I find that that is a situation where both of my, like the pillars of my career, if you would say, intersect in a really enjoyable way for me. Right, um, right. So I don't, I don't think uh, it's fair to choose. <laughs> and honestly, if for, I would say this for anybody that wants to be, in the music industry, you have to do more than one thing. You, like there are very, very few people that are making a substantial living doing one thing. Um, right. You have to do different things. And I can guarantee you that like any, like successful working singer in Los Angeles or Nashville is also teaching voice or also um, doing something else um, in, in addition, just because, you know, not just from a money standpoint, but the industry is constantly going like this. Um, so you have to be able to work when nothing else is going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think in either of those fields, you and I have talked um, <clears throat> before back when you were an undergrad and a master's student about the, uh, the dilemma of being aged out if you're a worship leader in a church and so often, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people hit a certain age and uh, the, the powers that be feel like they're not 
um, relevant sure. anymore for who they want to draw and they can be aged out in some ways. Are you, how are you dealing with that thinking forward in your path as you inevitably will get older? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, it's funny that you say that you bring up aging out because uh, I, there's a show at Universal Studios that I do where I am required to be a high school student or at least look like a high school student. Um, so, I mean, I, I like sort of pass right now, but uh, if, you know, fast forward five years, and I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to do that show anymore. So there's, uh, uh, there's always things where, you know, your, your time is set for certain things. Um, as a, and that, that's one of the reasons why I decided to stay and get a master's degree um, at CBU, knowing, knowing that, you know, even if teaching wasn't something I wanted to do immediately, um, it was something that was probably going to be a part of my future. Um, sure. So I don't know for there. I mean, when it comes to recording studio singers, um, you know, there's the ages go all the way up. Some of the right. people that work the most in Los Angeles are in their fifties and sixties. And as long as they've had great vocal health and, and all of that, you know, it's no big deal. Right. When it comes to like on stage work, um, for like Broadway and stuff in the past couple of years, we've actually seen a lot of roles for the mom and the, the dad figure. I mean, Dear Evan Hansen is a great example. Three of the like big characters in there are in their forties and fifties, Evan's mom, um, and, uh, uh, Connor and Zoe's parents. So I, I don't know. There's, I think there's a place for everybody, mm -hmm. but um, it's about, like I was saying earlier, it's about being willing to see what opportunities are coming your way and saying, yes, I'll, I'll try that. Let's go down this Avenue for a second and see what yeah. comes of it. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. Well, just, I mean, you've already done this in a way, but I mean, any last, you know, final words of advice for up and coming students as they attempt to pursue, you know, a, a challenging career? Yeah. In music. Any um, advice? Yeah, I, I think my, my biggest advice is to... I mean, biggest advice aside from the things that I've already said um, yeah. is to be self-aware, um, to be just talking about being a performer for a second, to be a performer in any industry, you have to be willing to look in the mirror and say, what do I have to offer? What can I bring? And it's not necessarily saying like, putting yourself in a box and saying, what can I, I can only do these kinds of roles, but it's, it's looking in the mirror and saying, I know I can do this, or I know I can do that. Because for somebody that's sitting behind a casting table, um, if you're constantly coming in for roles that you definitely couldn't do, maybe it's not your vocal type or, you know, something, something like that. Um, then it tells them that you don't know who you are. So I think spending the time to figure out who you are, what is your voice is super beneficial. Get with a, get with a vocal coach or a voice teacher that's going to help you get your technique down. Um, and can help focus you in the genre that you want to go into. Um, I think that's super important. And then for anybody that is writing, that's trying to, to make it out there, um, I think listen to, to a bunch of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Not just what is currently popular. Um, because there is a lot of really great music that can influence what you're writing today just from, you know, 
20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, open yourself up to all sorts of things. Um, when you're shopping in a department store, listen to what is playing and see if you can figure, figure it out. Um, don't just listen to the radio. Right. Good. Good. Well, that's, that's a lot of helpful advice, I think, Connor. Yeah, you, uh, giving your input and it's been good talking to you. Good to it's see been you. good talking to you too. I didn't get to any of my questions for you. Oh, <laughs> well, we have three minutes, I guess. Oh well, no. I mean, I guess I the one thing I just wanted to talk about was as a conductor for you, um, the relationship between a composer who's written something. And then the conductor who is then going to interpret it or translate it to his group. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit about your um, experience between those two things where it, not necessarily the conductor has a relationship with the composer and they're purely going off of the notes on the page. So what is it right. that you kind of pull out of music or what is it that you look for in a, line when you're picking stuff for your group? Well, I don't know well, if you can answer that in two minutes. It's a good question. I'll try <laughs> to make it brief. I mean, I'm always trying to make the music engaging. So engaging for the performers and engaging for the audience, both. It has to be engaging, whether it's slow and reflective and contemplative or highly energized. And I recognize that the composer has an intent that we want to stay true to to a certain extent but they're not always able to convey that with dots and indications like that. So I look at it as my job as the uh, interpreter of that music to push and pull and accentuate phrases and lines where it feels mm -hmm. like it should be accentuated at that mm -hmm. moment. And that's the underlying, always the notion. And sometimes I'll alter things specifically for the purpose of getting the performers, the singers or players to be more attuned to what I'm doing and, and thereby focusing themselves and heightening the energy. Or sometimes it's to accentuate a line. The quickest yeah. example I can think of is, is your arrangement of that acapella Star Spangled Banner, which everybody knows. Yeah, yeah. You didn't indicate to put a significant retard or fermata on those lines. Uh, twilight's last gleaming, but to do that as a conductor makes all of the performers lean on when's the next word gonna fall, where are we going? And yeah. I don't think that violated your intent or anybody else's, so. No, and honestly, I, that was one of, one of the things that I really, really enjoyed in, in my college period writing was, you know, throwing out these arrangements that I'd written and having somebody like you or, or somebody else in class conduct it and not just hear it on voices um, and not just on my computer, but to actually get an interpretation um, and say, oh, that's a great idea. I didn't think about that when I was writing this. I'm going to put that in there. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. I, I, I really enjoy a conductor that takes risks and, and interprets their, their, with their own flair. Yeah, that's one of the fun uh, joys of conducting, that's for sure. Yeah. I see Larry there. I think we, we've hit our, our time. Oh, yeah. We, we, there's really no time limit or whatever. But um, okay. I, one of the things I might, uh, Connor, is a lot of students want to know, how do you get your inspiration for pieces? They, it's, it's, it's the student's composition sometimes is a mystery. It's like, oh, does sure. it, like just the lightning bolt hit you and you come up with this great tune? So they always want to ask, they always want to know that question. How, you know, how do you come up with ideas for pieces? It's always different. Um, honestly, it is always different. Um, Indeed it is. The, I wrote for Excelsior that's coming out in, in, in I don't know, a couple months. Um, that song I wrote because one of my best friends died. And I, you know, I had to write something. Um, and so that is like an extreme case of like something serious happened and the inspiration came from that. Um, other songs, it's like, you know, 
I, maybe I am, you know, walking my dog out on the street and uh, I think of a melody line and I kind of go home and play with that and see what comes out. Um, so it, it's always different. I, I don't want to like say there's no answer, but um, I think maybe just always being open to inspiration coming from any different place and, and having your brain turned on, I think, to looking for that. Um, listening to different music, S something that I like to do is like buy sheet music books and then listen to the song and look at the music so you can actually see like what is happening. Maybe you find a bass line that you really like and like, oh, I want to base something off of that. Um, so, yeah. did I answer your question? <laughs> well, I think you're right. I think there isn't just one answer and most composers will tell you the same thing that it's, yeah it's piece dependent and sometimes it comes quick and sometimes it takes a long time and yeah and we don't really know as composers how that happens necessarily it just does totally yeah so um i appreciate you both taking the time out of your day to do this and um we certainly hope that uh students and teachers will get some use out of that out of this and uh learn something and connor since you're relatively new in the business and, and young person compared to us old folks up here so <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it, talked about it's like hey hey whoa <laughs> <laughs> great advice no it's great advice though for for young students who have maybe an interest in in thinking about composition or performing as a career which right. you know some some see that is like some shining light they'll never be able to get to but you're obviously a proof that you can make it work and you can make it happen yeah. if you work really, really hard and have, have the talent to do it. And you can do both too. Right. Yeah. Well, musicians are like, you know, jack of all trades most of the time anyway. Exactly. We yeah. have to have multiple jobs in order to make a living as it, right. yeah. as it goes anyway. So yeah. appreciate it. So I appreciate you both taking the time and uh, thanks a lot. And, and uh, we'll hopefully get a chance to meet in person at some point in time. Yeah. At some yeah. point. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank gentlemen. You.